How many of you have ever been to New York City? Jazz is a great book to read if you like New York City. It's all about New York City. So next we'll have Lauren Brown, who's majoring in multi-platform production, and she is reading from Beloved. Good afternoon. There is a loneliness that can be rocked. Arms crossed, knees drawn up, holding, holding on. This motion, unlike a ship's, smooths and contains the rocker. It's an inside kind, wrapped tight like skin. Then there is a loneliness that roams. No rocking can hold it down. It is alive on its own, a dry and spreading thing that makes the sound of one's own feet going seem to come from a far off place. Everybody knew what she was called, but nobody anywhere knew her name. Disremembered and unaccounted for, she cannot be lost because no one is looking for her. And even if they were, how can they call her if they don't know her name? Although she has claim, she is not claimed. In the place where long grass opens, the girl who waited to be loved and cry shame erupts into her separate parts to make it easy for the chewing laughter to swallow her all away. It was not a story to pass on. They forgot her like a bad dream. After they made up their tales, shaped and decorated them, those that saw her day on the porch quickly and deliberately forgot her. It took longer for those who had spoken to her, lived with her, fallen in love with her, to forget until they realized they couldn't remember or repeat a single thing she said and began to believe that other than what they themselves were thinking, she hadn't said anything at all. So in the end, they forgot her too. Remembering seemed un unwise. They never knew where or why she crouched or whose was the underwater face she needed like that where the memory of the smile under her chin might have been and was not. A latch latched and lichen attached to its apple green bloom to the metal. What made her think her fingernails could open the locks the rain rained on? It was not a story to pass on. So they forgot her like an unpleasant dream during a, during a troubling sleep. Occasionally, however, the rustle of a skirt hushes when they wake and the knuckles brushing a cheek in sleep seem to belong to the sleeper. Sometimes the photograph of a close friend or relative looked at too long shifts and sometimes more familiar than the dear face itself moves there. They can touch it if they like, but don't because they know things will never be the same if they do. This is not a story to pass on. Down by the stream in the back of, back of 124, her footprints come and go, come and go. They are so familiar. Should a child, an adult, place his feet in them, they will fit. Take them out and they disappear again as though nobody ever walked there. By and by, all trace is gone. And what is forgotten is not only the footprints, but the water too and what is down there. The rest is weather, not the breath of the disremembered and unaccounted for, but wind in the eaves or spring ice thawing too quickly. Just weather, certainly no clamor for a kiss. Thank you, Lauren. Beloved is considered uh, Morrison's Nobel novel, even though when you win a big prize like that for literature, you're actually winning for a body of work, not just one piece of work. But Beloved is the novel that she is credited for winning the Nobel because of. How many of you read Beloved? So Beloved is about a ghost. It's about a lady who tried to keep her children from going into slavery by killing them. She was trying to kill three of them, she only killed one. And when that one should have been a teenager, the teenager came back alive and lived in the house with them. And the teenager was very upset that her mother had murdered her. So that's what that story is about. Next we'll have Grace D, who's a psychology major, and she's reading from the nonfiction essay, Eve Remembering. Good afternoon. I tore from a limb fruit that had lost its green. My hands were worn by the heat of an apple, fire red and humming. 
I bid sweet power to the core. How can I say what it was like? The taste, the taste undid my eyes and led me far from the gardens planted for a child to wildernesses deeper than any master's call. Now these cool hands guide what they once caressed. Lips forget what they have kissed. My eyes now pull their light, better the summit to see. I will do it all over again, be the harbor and set the sail, loose the breeze and harness the gale, cherish the harvest of what I have been, better the summit to scale, better the summit to be. Thank you. Morrison wrote a number of nonfiction essays. She was often invited to give speeches, as you might imagine. And all of those have been collected in a posthumous volume. Posthumous means after death, in case you don't know. Um, a posthumous volume called The Source of Self-Regard. It's a pink book. And that book is published in England under the name Mouthful of Blood, which is totally Morrison mouthful of blood. So next we'll have um, a biology major who came to us to read for extra credit because he's committed to keeping his grades as high as possible, he said. So he does all extra credit in addition to getting A's. His name is Abdul Qadir Youssef. He's reading from Song of Solomon. Good afternoon. You all want a soft-boiled egg, she asked. The, boy looked at each, the boys looked at each other. She changed the rhythm on them. They didn't want an egg, but they did want to be with her, to go inside the wine house of this lady who had one earring, no navel, and looked like a tall black tree. No thanks, but we would like a drink of water, Guitar smiled back at her. Well, step right in. She opened the door and they followed her into a large sunny room that looked like both barren and cluttered. A moss green sack hung from the ceiling. Candles were stuck in bottles everywhere. Newspapers, articles, and magazine pictures were nailed to the walls. But other than a rocking chair, two straight back chairs, a large table, a sink and a stove, there was no furniture. Pervading everything was the odor of pine and farmington fruit. You ought to try one. I know how to do them just right. I don't like my wife to move, you know. The yolk I want soft, but not runny. Want it like wet velvet? How come you don't just try one? She dumped the peelings in a large crock, which like most everything in the house had been made for some other purpose. Now she stood before the dry sink, pumping water into a blue and white washing basin, which she used for a saucepan. Now, the water and the egg have to meet each other on a kind of equal standing. One can't get the upper hand over the other, so the temperature has to be the same for both. I knock the chill off the water first, just to chill. I don't let it get warm because the egg is room temperature, you see. Now then, the real secret behind here is the boiling. When the tiny bubbles come to the surface, when they are as big as peas, and just before they, are, before they get big as marbles. Well, right then, you take the pot off the fire. You don't just put the fire out, you take the pot off. Then, you put a folded newspaper over the pot and do one small obligation, like answering the door or emptying the bucket and bringing it in off the porch I generally go to the toilet. Not for a long stay, mind you, just a short one. If you do all that, you get yourself a perfect soft boiled egg. Thank you. Toni Morrison's commitment to recipes in her book is, in her books are very scattered, but they're very interesting and trying to uh, make a perfect soft boiled egg is a hard job. So those of us who study Morrison, we were thrilled and we all tested with the newspaper on the top. Next we'll have Kaisha Hancock, who's in multimedia journalism and she's reading from Song of Solomon. Uh, 
Making Dad dug in his pocket for his keys and curled his fingers around them, letting their bunchy solidity calm him. They were the keys to all the doors of his houses, only four true houses, the rest were really shacks. And he fondled them from time to time as he walked down not Doctor Street to his office. At least he thought of it as his office, had even painted the word office on the door. But the plate glass window contradicted him. In peeling gold letters arranged in a semicircle, his business established was declared to be Sunny Shop. Scraping the previous owner's name off was hardly worth the, the trouble since he couldn't scrape it from anybody's mind. His storefront office was never called anything but Sunny Shop, although nobody now could remember 30 years back when, presumably, Sunny did something or other there. He walked there now. Strutted is the better word, for he had a high behind and an athlete's stride. Thinking of names, surely he thought he and his sister had some ancestor, some lithe young man with onyx skin and legs as straight as cane stalks, who had a name that was real, a name given to him at birth with love and seriousness, a name that was not a joke or, nor a disguise nor a brand name, but who this lithe young man was and where his cane stalk legs carried him from or to could never be known. No, nor his name, his own parents in some mood of perseverance or resignation had agreed to abide by a naming done to them by somebody who couldn't have cared less, agreed to take and pass on to all their issue this heavy name scrawled in perfect thoughtlessness by a drunken Yankee in the Union Army, a literal slip of the pen handed to his father on a piece of paper in which he handed on to his only son, and his son likewise handed on to his. Thank you. So Song of Solomon is a book about property um, when Toni Morrison was uh, memorialized in New York City at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, Oprah Winfrey came and read from Song of Solomon all about how important it is for you to have property in this world. And her diamond earrings were swinging and everybody's like, oh my God. Anyway, <laughs> next we'll have Tishana Long Rivera. She's majoring in hospitality management and reading from Sula. Good afternoon. As soon as the door was shut, Sula breathed through her mouth. While Nell was in the room, the pain had increased. Now that this new painkiller, the one she had been holding in reserve, was on her way, her was on the way, her misery was manageable. She let a piece of her mind lay on Nell. It was funny sending Nell off to the drugstore right away like that, after she had not seen her to speak to for, year for years. The drugstore was where Edna Finch's mellow house used to be years back when they were girls. Where they used to go, the two of them, hand in hand, for the 18 cent ice cream sundaes, past the time and a half pool hall, where the sprawling men and pig meat said pig meat, and they said that in the cool room, cool room with the marble tabletops, and ate the first ice cream sundaes of their lives. Now Nell was going back there alone, and Sula was waiting for the medicine the doctor said not to take until the pain had gotten really bad. And she supposed really bad was now. Although you could never tell, she wondered for an instant what Nellie wanted, why she had come. Did she want to gloat, make up, following the line of thought required more concentration than she could muster? Pain was greedy. It demanded all of her attention, but it was the it was good that the new medicine, the reserve, would be brought to her by her old friend, Nell. She remembered always thrived on a crisis. The closed place in the water, Hannah's funeral, Nell was the best. When Tula imitated her, or tried to, those long years ago, it always ended up in some action noteworthy, not for its coolness, but mostly for it being bizarre. The one time she tried to protect Nell, she had cut off her own fingertip and earned not only not Nell's gratitude, but her disgust. Thank you. If you ever get a chance to read Sula, you should. Sula is a book about a friendship between two black women and what kinds of travesties it takes to actually break up such a friendship. 
Next, we will have Mark Gomes, who is an English major and is reading from Toni Morrison's later novel, Home. Good afternoon. I'll be reading chapter one. They rose up like men. We saw them, like men they stood. We shouldn't have been anywhere near that place. Like most farmland outside Lotus, Georgia, this one here had plenty of scary warning signs. The threats hung from wire mesh fences with wooden stakes every 50 or so feet. But when we saw a crawl space that some animal had dug, a coyote maybe, or a coon dug, we couldn't resist. Just kids we were. The grass was shoulder high for her and waist high for me. So looking out for snakes, we crawled through it on our bellies. The reward was worth for the harm grass juice of clouds gnats did out to our eyes. Because they're right in front of us, about 50 yards off, they stood like men. Their raised hooves crashing and striking, their manes tossing back from their wild white eyes, they bit each other like dogs. But when they stood reared up on their hind legs, their four legs around the withers of the other. We held our breath in wonder. One was rust colored, the other deep black, both sunny with sweat. The nays were was frightening as the silence following a kick of hind legs into the lifted lips of the opponent. Nearby coats and mares and different nibbled grass or looked away. Then it stopped. The rust colored one dropped his head and pawed the ground while the winner looped off in an arc, nudging the mares before him. As we elbowed back through the grass, looking for the dugout place, avoiding the line of parked trucks beyond, we lost our way. Although it took forever to recite the fence, neither of us panicked until we heard voices urgent below. I grabbed her arm and put a finger to my lips, never lifting our heads. Just peeping through the grass, we saw them pull a body from the wheelbarrow and throw it into a hole already waiting. One foot stuck over the edge and quivered, as though it could get out, as though with a little effort it could break through the dirt being shoveled in. We could not see the faces of the men during the burying, only their trousers, but we saw the edge of a spade dive and jerking foot down to the joint of the rest of itself. When she saw the black foot with its creamy pink and mud streaked sole being whacked into the grave, her whole body began to shake. I hugged her shoulders tight and tried to pull her trembling to my own bones because a brother for years, four years older, I thought I could handle it. The men were long gone and the moon was candlelit by the time we left, safe enough to disturb even one blade of grass on, I'm on a move on our stomachs, searching for the scooped out part under the fence. When we got home, we expected to be whipped or at least scolded for staying out so late, but the grown-ups did not notice us. Some disturbance had their attention. Since you're set on telling my story, whatever you think and whatever you write down, know this. I really forgot about this burial. I only remember the horses. They were so beautiful, so brutal, and they stood like men. Thank you, Mark. Um, Toni Morrison writes a lot about brothers and sisters, so if you're one of those, you probably find yourself in that book and Song of Solomon as well. So now we'll ha hear from Jasmine Gabrielle. She's a graduate student in the School of Global Journalism, and she's reading from A Mercy. Um, don't be afraid. My talent can't hurt you in spite of what I've done, and I promise to lie quickly in the dark, weeping perhaps or occasionally seeing the blood once more, but I'll never again unfold my limbs to rise up in bare teeth, I explain. You can think of what I tell you a confession, if you like, but one of full of curiosities familiar only in dreams and during those moments when a doll's profile plays in the steam of a kettle, or when a corn husk doll sitting on a shelf is soon splaying in a corner of a room and the wicked of how it got there is plain. Stranger things happen all the time everywhere. You know, I know you know. One question is, who is responsible? Another is, can you read? If a peahen refuses to broad, I read it quickly, and sure enough, that night, I see a Mina May standing hand in hand with her little boy. My shoes jam in the pocket of her apron. Other signs need more time to understand. Often there are many signs, or a bright omen clouds up too fast. I sort them and try to recall. Yet I know I'm missing much, like not reading the garden snake crawling up the door saddle to die. Let me start with what I know for certain. The beginning begins with the shoes. When a child, I am never able to abide be being barefoot and always beg for shoes, anybody's shoes, even on the hottest days. My mother, Amina May, is frowning, is angry at what she sees, I mean, excuse me, says on my predefined ways. 
Only bad women wear high heels. I am dangerous, she says. And wild but she relents and lets me wear the throwaway shoes from Senora's house. Pointy toed, one raised heel, the other worn and buckle on top. As a result, Lena says, my feet are useless. We'll always be too tender for life and never have strong souls, tougher than leather, that life requires. Lena is correct. Florence says, it's 1690. Who else these days have hands of a slave and feet of a Portuguese lady? So when I sat out to find you, she and mistress gave me sir's boots that fit a man, not a girl. They stuff them with hay and oily corn husks and tell them to hide the letter inside stocking. No matter the itch of the ceiling wax, I'm lettered, but I do not read what mistress writes, and Lena and Sorrow cannot. Thank you, Jasmine. So for those of you just coming in, I'm AJ Verdell. I teach in the Department of English and Language Arts, and we're really thrilled that you're here. Before we take a picture of this beautiful group, I'm going to read you a little bit from Song of Solomon, which was Toni Morrison's breakthrough book. That was the book that she got famous on, and it's the top seller, even though Beloved is right behind. In this scene, we see Circe, who's a maid and an older woman. We see Pilate, who's kind of the star of Song of Solomon, and she's the one who looks like a black tree. Who read that? She looks, yes. She looks like a black tree, and she has no navel, which is a very interesting story. Um, and her brother, Macon, who's the big property owner in Song of Solomon. So um, Macon and Pilate, the brother and sister, have seen their father murdered. Their father was sitting on a fence trying to guard their farm, and these guys came, white guys, and shot him off the fence. So this scene is the aftermath of them having seen their father murdered. Circe, the midwife, who had delivered them both, and who was there when their mother died, and when Pilate was named, she worked in a large house, a mansion outside Danville, for a family of what was then called gentlemen farmers. The orphans called to Circe from the vegetable garden early in the morning, as soon as they saw the smoke from the cook stove rising. Circe let them in, pressing her hands together with relief and saying how glad she was to see them alive. She had known what had happened to them after the killing. Macon explained that he had buried his father himself down by that part of the stream on Lincoln's Heaven where they used to fish together, the place where he had caught the nine pound trout. The grave was shallower than it ought to be, but he piled rocks there. Circe told them to stay with her until they could all figure out what to do, some place for them to go. She hid them in that house easily. There were rooms the family seldom went into, but if they weren't safe, she was prepared to share her own room, which was off limits to everybody in the house. It was small, though, so they agreed to stay in a pair of rooms on the third floor that were used only for storage. Circe would bring them food, water to wash in, and she would empty their slop jar. Macon asked if they couldn't work there. Would her mistress take them on as kitchen help, yard help, anything? Circe bit her tongue trying to get the words out. You crazy? You say you saw the men what killed him? You think they don't know you saw them? If they kill a growed man, what do you think they do to you? Be sensible. We got to plan and figure this thing out. Macon and Pilate stayed there two weeks, not a day longer. He had been working hard on a farm since he was five or six years old, and she was born wild. They couldn't bear the stillness the walls, the boredom of having nothing to do but wait for the day's excitement of eating and going to the toilet. Anything was better than walking all day on carpeting, than eating the soft, bland food white people ate, than having to sneak a look at the sky from behind ivory curtains. Pilate began to cry the day Circe brought her white toast and cherry jam for breakfast. She wanted her own cherries from her own cherry tree with stems and seeds, 
not some too sweet mashed up mush. She thought she would die if she couldn't hold her mouth under Ulysses S. Grant's teeth and squirt the warm milk into her mouth or pull a tomato off its vine and eat it where she stood. Craving certain specific foods had almost devastated her. That, plus the fact that her earlobe was sore from the operation she had performed on herself. Her ear had her near hysteria. Before they left the farm, she'd taken a scrap of brown paper with her name on it from the Bible. And after a long time trying to make up her mind between a snuff box and a sunbonnet with blue ribbons on it, she took the little brass box that had belonged to her mother. Her miserable days in the mansion were spent planning how to make an earring out of the box, which would house her name. She found a piece of wire, but couldn't get it through. Finally, after much begging and whining, Cersei got a Negro blacksmith to solder a bit of gold wire to the box. Pilot rubbed her ear until it was numb, burned the end of the wire, and punched it through her earlobe. Make and fasten the wire ends into a knot, but the lobe was swollen and running pus. At Cersei's instruction, she put cobwebs on it to draw the pus out and stop the bleeding. On the night of the day she cried about the cherries, the two of them decided that, that, when, that when her ear got better, they would leave. It was too much of a hardship on Cersei anyway for them to stay there, and if her white folks found out about them, they might let her go. One morning, Cersei climbed all the way to the third floor with a covered plate of scrapple and found two empty rooms. They didn't even take a blanket, just a knife and a tin cup. Thank you for coming to help us celebrate Toni Morrison's birthday. Toni Morrison is the only African American to have ever won a Nobel Prize in Literature, which is a very, very, very big deal. Toni Morrison died in August 2019, and for many years she was the greatest living American writer. I know that that is um, kind of an argument, which means that you could use it as a thesis statement. <laughs> However, that is my opinion. So all these beautiful people here on the stage are going to read to us some excerpt from Toni Morrison's 11 novels and three books of nonfiction. We are gonna start with Dr. Baruti Capano, who is the chair of the Multi-Platform Communications Department. <coughs> After we go through all these readers, we're going to turn the music back on. You've been listening to Nina Simone, who was Toni Morrison's favorite artist. And so that's why we're playing Nina Simone for her birthday. If you're not familiar with Nina Simone, you're probably wrong because she sampled all the time. But if you listen to her, there's a big education waiting for you there. Dr. Capano? from Toni Morrison's Jazz. I lived a long time, maybe too much in my own mind. People say I should come out more, mix. I agree that I close off in places, but if you have been left standing as I have while your partner overstays at another appointment or promises to give you exclusive attention after supper, but has fallen asleep just as you have begun to speak, well, it can make you inhospitable if you aren't careful. The last thing I want to be. Hospitality is gold in this city. You have to be clever to figure out how to be welcoming and defensive at the same time. When to love something and when to quit. If you don't know how, you can end up out of control or controlled by some outside thing like that hard case last winter. Word was that underneath the good times and the easy money, something evil ran the streets and nothing was safe, not even the dead. Proof of this being Violet's outright attack on the very subject of a funeral ceremony, barely three days into 1926. A host of thoughtful people looked at the signs, the weather, the number, their own dreams, 
and believed it was the commencement of all sorts of destruction, that the scandal was a message sent to warn the good and rip up the faithless. I don't know who was more ambitious, the doomsayers or valid, but it's hard to match the superstitious for great expectations. Thank you. Next, we'll have a computer science major, Mr. Derek Desveen. He's reading from The Bluest Eye. Bacola went to the window, looked down the empty street. A tuff of glass had forced his way through a crack in the sidewalk, only to meet a raw wind. She thought of Dewey Prince and how he loved Miss Marie. What did love feel like, she wondered. How did grown act when they love each other? Eat fish together. Into her eyes, she, she, came, she came to a picture of Charlie and, and Miss Brit, and Brit Love in bed. He making sounds as though he was in pain, as though something had him by the throat and wouldn't let go. Terrible as his noise were, they were not really as bad as no, no noise at all coming from her mother. It was though, as though she was not even there. Maybe that was, that was love, choking sounds and silence. Thank you. Next we'll have Brianna Crudup, who is an English major and is reading from the novel Jazz. I'm crazy about this city. Daylight slants like a razor, cutting the building in half. In the top half, I see looking faces, and it's not easy to tell which are people, which the work of stonemasons. Below is a shadow where any blase thing takes place. Clarinets and lovemaking, fists and the voices of sorrowful women. A city like this one makes me dream tall and fill in on things. Hep, it's the bright steel rocking above the shade below that does it. When I look over strips of green grass lining the river at church steeples and into the cream and copper halls of apartment buildings, I'm strong. Alone, yes, but top notch and indestructible, like the city in 1926, when all the wars are over and there will never be another one. The people down there in the shadow are happy about that. At last, at last, everything is ahead. The smart ones say so, and people listening to them and reading what they write down agree. Here comes the new, look out. There goes the sad stuff, the bad stuff, the things nobody could help stuff, the way everybody was and then and there. Forget that. History is all over you all, and everything's ahead at last. In halls and offices, people are sitting around thinking future thoughts about projects and bridges and fast clicking trains underneath. The AMP hires a color black clerk, big leg women with pink kitty tongues roll money into green tubes for later on. Then they laugh and put their arms around each other. Regular people corner thieves in alleys for a quick retribution, and if he is stupid and has robbed wrong, thieves corner him too. Hoodlums hand out goodies, do their best to stay interesting, and since they are being watched for excitement, they pay attention to their clothes and the carving out of insults. Nobody wants to be an emergency at Harlem Hospital, but if a Negro surgeon is visiting, pride cuts down the pain. Thank you. One of the notions we focus on on our department in our department is how you can learn from literature. And so this whole idea that the A&P hired a colored clerk or that there's one Negro surgeon at Harlem Hospital, that's what was real in the era of the book. So you get a quick lesson in history while you read Toni Morrison. 
Next, we'll have Abriana Day. She's majoring in psychology and is reading from Song of Solomon. It sounded old, deserve, old and tired and beaten to death, deserve. Now it seemed to me that he was always saying or thinking that he didn't deserve some bad luck or some bad treatment from others. He told Guitar that he didn't deserve his family's dependence, hatred, or whatever. That he didn't even deserve to hear all the misery and mutual accusations his parents unloaded on him. Nor did he deserve Hagar's vengeance. But why shouldn't his parents tell him their personal problems? If not him, then who? And if a stranger could try to kill him, surely Hagar, who knew him and who he'd thrown away like a wad of chewing gum after the flavor was gone, she had a right to try to kill him too. Apparently he thought he deserved only to be loved from a distance, though, and given what he wanted. And in return, he would be, what, pleasant, generous? Maybe all he was really saying was, I am not responsible for your pain. Share your happiness with me, but not your unhappiness. There were troublesome thoughts, but they wouldn't go away. Under the moon, on the ground, alone, with not even the sound of baying dogs to remind him that he was with other people. His self, the cocoon that was personality, gave away. He could barely set his own hand and couldn't see his feet. He was only his breath, coming slower now, and his thoughts. The rest of him had disappeared. So the thoughts came, unobstructed by other people, by things, even by the sight of himself. There was nothing here to help him, not his money, his car, his father's reputation, his suits or shoes. In fact, they hampered him, except for his broken watch and his wallet with about $200. All he had started out with on his journey was gone. His suitcase with the scotch, the shirts, the space for bags of gold, his snap brim hat, his tie, his shirt, his three-piece suit, his socks and his shoes. His watch and his $200 would be of no help out here, where all a man had was what he was born with or had learned to use. Thank you. Next, we will have Professor Titi Lyo Akante. She is on the faculty in the English department, is reading from Sula. Although most of the people remember the time when the sky was black for two hours with clouds and clouds of pigeons, and although they were accustomed to excesses in nature, too much heat, too much cold, too little rain, rain to flooding, they still dreaded the way a relatively trivial phenomenon could become sovereign in their lives and bend their minds to its will. In spite of their fear, they reacted to an oppressive oddity or what they called evil days with an acceptance that bordered on welcome. Such evil days must be avoided, they felt, and precautions must naturally be taken to protect themselves from it. But they let it run its course, fulfill itself, and never invented either ways to alter it, to annihilate it, or to prevent its happening again. So also were they with people. What was taken by outsiders to be slackness, slovenliness, or even generosity was in fact a full recognition of the legitimacy of forces other than good ones. They did not believe doctors could heal. For them, none had ever done so. They did not believe death was accidental. Life might be, but death was deliberate. They did not believe nature was askew, only inconvenient. 
plague and drought were as natural as springtime. If milk could curdle, God knows robins could fall. The purpose of evil was to survive it, and they determined without ever knowing they had made up their minds to do it, to survive floods, white people, tuberculosis, famine, and ignorance. They knew anger well, but not despair. And they didn't stone sinners for the same reasons they didn't commit suicide. It was beneath them. Thank you. Uh, Toni Morrison was revolutionary in her time to be uh, honest about acknowledging that surviving white people is a job. Um, here at Morgan, we have uh, several youth poet laureates to our credit, and one of them is here to read to us. His name is Muhammad Tall. He was a Quarles Scholar and a political science major, and he's reading from uh, Morrison's Nobel Lecture. <coughs> The systematic looting of language can be recognized by the tendency of its users to forego its nuanced, complex, midwifery properties for menace and subjugation. Oppressive language does more than represent violence. It is violence. Does more than represent the limits of knowledge. It limits knowledge. Whether it is obscuring state language or the faux language of mindless media, whether it is the proud but calcified language of the academy or the commodity-driven language of science, whether it is the malign language of law without ethics or language designed for the estrangement of minorities, hiding its racist plunder in its literary cheek, it must be rejected, altered, and exposed. It is the language that drinks blood, laps vulnerabilities, tucks its fascist boots under crinolines of respectability and patriotism as it moves relentlessly toward the bottom line and the bottomed out mind. Sexist language, racist language, theistic language, all are typical of the, po of the policing languages of mastery and cannot, do not, permit new knowledge or encourage the mutual exchange of ideas. Thank you. Morrison's Nobel Lecture is very famous, also very short. If you get a chance, it's a good read. Talks about birds and old people and racist language. Next, we'll have Michaela Oliver. She's a psychology major, and she's reading from Beloved. Definitions belong to the definers, not the defined. Thank you. Memorized and profound. <laughs> Next, we'll have Professor Linda Johnson, who teaches in English and Language Art and is reading an excerpt from Jazz. Malvin lived with newspapers and other people's stories, printed in small books. When she was not making her office buildings, building sparkle, she was melding the print stories with her keen observation of the people around her. Very little escaped this woman who rode the trolley against traffic at 6 p.m., who examined the trash baskets of powerful white men, looked at photographs of women and children on their desk, heard their hallway conversation and the bathroom laughter penetrating the broom closet like fumes from her bottle of ammonia. She examined their bottles and resituated the flask tucked under cushions and behind books whose words were printed in two columns. She knew who had a passion for justice as well as ladies' undergarments, who loved his wife and who shared one. The one who fought with his son and would not speak to his father. 
for they did not cover the mouthpiece when they talked on the phone to her to ask her to leave as she inched her way down the halls into their offices, nor did they drop their voices to confidential whispers when they worked late doing what they called the real business. But Malvin was not interested in them. She simply noticed her interest lay in the neighborhood people. So Mal Vaughn, who Professor Johnson was just reading about, is like everybody's nosy neighbor. <laughs> the lady who comes to you and told you that she saw you do what you did the night before, and you're like, what business is it of yours? Um, next, we will have Chloe Colbert. She is a creative writing concentration English major, and she is reading from Song of Solomon. Milkman knew no songs and had no singing voice that anybody would want to hear. But he couldn't ignore the urgency in her voice. Speaking the words without the least bit of a tune, he sang for the lady. Sugar girl, don't leave me here, cotton balls to choke me. Sugar girl, don't leave me here, buckra's arm to yoke me. The blood was not pulsing out any longer, and there was something black and bubbly in her mouth. Yet when she moved her head a little to gaze at something behind his shoulder, it took a while for him to realize that she was dead. And when he did, he could not stop the worn old words from coming, louder and louder as though sheer volume would wake her. He woke only the birds, who shuddered off into the air. Milkman laid her head down on the rock. Two of the birds circled around them, one dived into the new grave and scooped something shiny in its beak before it flew away. He knew then why he loved her so. Without ever leaving the ground, she could fly. There must be another one like you, he whispered. There has got to be at least one more woman like you. Even as he knelt over her, he knew there wouldn't be another mistake that the minute he stood up, Guitar would try to blow his head off. He stood up. Guitar, he shouted. Tar, 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 said the hills. Over here, brother man, can you see me? Milkman cuffed his mouth with one hand and waved the other over his head. Here I am, 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 said the rocks. You want me, huh? You want my life? Life, life. Life, life, squatting on the edge of the other flathead rock with only the night to cover him, Guitar smiled over the barrel of his rifle. My man, he murmured to himself, my main man. He put the rifle on the ground and stood up. Milkman stopped waving and narrowed his eyes. He could just make out Guitar's head over and shoulders in the dark. You want my life? Milkman was not shouting now. You need it? Here, without wiping away the tears, taking a deep breath, or even bending his knees, he leaped. As fleet and bright as the, lo the lodestar, he wheeled toward Guitar and did not matter which one of them would give up the ghost in the killing arms of his brother. For now he knew what Shalimar knew. If you surrendered to the air, you could ride it. So Chloe just read Toni Morrison's favorite passage from all of her books. You can find that on YouTube, and you can hear Toni Morrison imitating the mountains echoing back, and guitar calling to his friend, and leaping to what was potentially his own shooting. So Chloe made a good choice. Next we will have Darlin Dyson, who's majoring in psychology and is reading from The Bluest Eye. Frida brought her four graham crackers on a saucer and some milk and a blue and white Shirley Temple cup. 
She was a long time with the milk and gazed fondly at the silhouette of Shirley Temple's dimpled face. Frida and she had a loving conversation about how cute Shirley Temple was. I couldn't join them in their adoration because I hated Sher Shirley. Not because she was cute, but because she danced with Bojangles, who was my friend, my uncle, my daddy, and who ought to have been, self been soft shoeing it and chuckling with me. Instead, he was enjoying, sharing, giving a lovely dance thing with one of those little white girls whose socks never slid down under their heels. So I said, I like Jane Withers down under their heels. So I said, I'm sorry. They gave me a puzzled look, decided I was incomprehensible, and continued their reminiscing about old squint-eyed Shirley. Younger than both Frida and Pecola, I had not yet arrived at the turning point in the development of my psyche, which would allow me to love her. What I felt at that time was unsullied hatred. But before that, I had felt a stranger, more frightening thing than hatred for all of the Shirley Temples of the world. Thank you. How many of you have ever heard of Bojangles? Yes? So Bojangles was a dancer, an older black man before his career took off, and he's in lots of movies with little Shirley Temple, who I'm not so concerned if you don't know who she is. <laughs> but if you haven't investigated Mr. Bojangles, please do, there's a song about him. And one of the things that happens when you write novels is you can make up songs and you can put real heroes in them. So novels are really educational experiences. Next, we will have Dr. Denise Jarrett, who is in the English and uh, Language Arts Department, and she is reading from Beloved. <laughs> the risk he held out for the, bra bra the bracelets that evening were as steady as were the legs he stood on when chains were attached to the leg irons. But when they shoved him into the box and dropped the cage door down, his hands quit taking instruction. On their own, they traveled. Nothing could stop them or get their attention. They would not hold his penis to urinate or a spoon to scoop lumps of lima beans into his mouth. The miracle of their obedience came with the hammer at dawn. All 46 men woke to the rifle shot all 46. Three white men walked along the trench, unlocking the doors one by one. No one stepped through. When the last lock was opened, the three returned and lifted the bars one by one. And one by one, the black men emerged promptly. And without the poke of a rifle butt, they had been there more than a day, promptly with the butt if like Baldi, they had just arrived. When all 46 were standing in a line in the trench, another rifle shot signaled the climb out and up to the ground above, where 1,000 feet of the best hand forged chain in Georgia stretched. Each man bent and waited. The first man pick up, picked up the end and threaded it through the loop on his leg iron. He stood up and shuffled a little, brought the chain tip to the next prisoner, who did likewise. As the chain was passed on and each man stood in the other's place, the line of men turned around, facing the boxes they had come out of. Not one spoke to the other, at least not with words. The eyes had to tell what they were to tell. Help me this morning's bad. I'll make it. New man, steady now, steady. 
chain up completed, they knelt down. The dew, more likely than not, was missed by then. Heavy sometimes, as if the dogs were quiet and just breathing, you could hear doves. Kneeling in the mist, they waited for the whim of a guard, or two, or three. Or maybe all of them wanted it. Wanted it from one prisoner in, a partic in particular, or none, or all. Breakfast? Want some breakfast, nigger? Yes, sir. Hungry, nigger? Yes, sir. Here you go. Occasionally, a kneeling man clo cho chose gunshot in his head as the peace price, maybe, of taking a bit of foreskin with him to Jesus. Paul D. did not know that then. He was looking at the palsied hands, smelling the guard, listening to his soft grunts, so like the doves, as he stood before the man kneeling in mist on his right. Convinced he was next, Paul D. wrenched, vomiting up nothing at all, and observing guard smashed his shoulder with the rifle, and the engaged one decided to skip the new man for the time being, least his pants and shoes got soiled by nigger puke. Morrison was well known for being able and willing to write about what was horrible. Next, we will have Kennedy Sampson. She's a marketing major and a first year student here, and she is reading an excerpt from Tar Baby. All around her, it was like that. A fast track on the head if you let hunger show. So she decided then and there, at the age of 12 in Baltimore, never to be broken in the hands of any man. Whatever it took, screaming teeth or knife blades, never. And yes, she would tap dance, and yes, she would skate. But she would do it with a frown, pugnacious lips, and scary eyes, because never. And anyone who wanted nice from this little colored girl would have to get it with pliers and chloral form, because never. When her mother died and she went to Philadelphia and then away to school, she was quick to learn. But no touche, teacher, and no, I do not smile, because never. It smoothed out a little as she grew older. The pugnacious lips became a seductive pout, eyes more heated than scary. But beneath the easy manners was a claw, always ready to rein in the dogs, because never. Thank you, Kennedy, and thank you for showing up as a first-year student. We're proud of you. Um, next, we will hear from Dr. Antia DeShields, who is also in the Department of English and Language Arts. Dr. DeShields is reading from Toni Morrison's first and most notorious um, nonfiction book called Playing in the Dark, Whiteness and the Literary Imagination. The thing that I love most and appreciate most about Toni about Tony Morrison is that she encourages us as thinkers, speakers, and writers to not only master English, but to be critical of it. In the same way that this young man, the Poet Laureate, said language can be oppressive, but she also teaches us that language can be liberating. I was interested as I had been for a long time, in the way black people ignite critical moments of discovery or change or emphasis in literature not written by them. Black or colored people and symbolic figurations of blackness are markers for the benevolent and the wicked, the spiritual and the voluptuous, of sinful but delicious sensuality, coupled with demands for purity and restraint. There are many examples of these narrative gear shifts, metaphors, summonings, rhetorical gestures of triumph, despair, and closure, dependent on the acceptance of the associative language of dread and love that accompanies blackness. Neither blackness nor people of color stimulates in me notions of excessive, limitless love, anarchy, or routine dread. 
I cannot rely on these metaphorical shortcuts because I am a black writer, struggling with and through a language that can powerfully evoke and enforce hidden signs of racial superiority, cultural hegemony, and dismissive othering of people and language, which are by no means marginal or already and completely known and knowable in my work. My vulnerability would lie in romanticizing blackness rather than demonizing it, vilifying whiteness rather than reifying it. The kind of work I've always wanted to do requires me to learn how to maneuver ways to free up the language from its sometimes sinister, frequently lazy, and determined chains. Thank you. So that book, Whiteness and the Literary Imagination, is the subtitle, Playing in the Dark is the title. That book was like an earthquake in the context of English language and literature. Um, we are um, oppressed by our language without even noticing it. In my classes, I often talk to students about what I call color-based language, where everything that's black is bad and everything that's white is good. And that's kind of the simple version of what Toni Morrison is saying, nope, nine, no more, we're not doing that. And so whiteness in the literary imagination is all about how to change the language, refuse the language, torque the language so it is supportive of you rather than critical of you. So thank you, Dr. DeShields. Next, we will have Kayla Dodd, who is an English major and is reading an excerpt from The Bluest Eye. Outdoors, we knew, was the real terror of life. The threat of being outdoors surfaced frequently in those days. Every possible of, possibility of excess was curtailed with it. If somebody ate too much, he could end up outdoors. If somebody used too much coal, he could end up outdoors. People could gamble themselves outdoors, drink themselves outdoors. Sometimes mothers put their sons outdoors. And when that happened, regardless of what the son had done, all sympathy was with him. He was outdoors, and his own flesh had done it. To be put outdoors by a landlord was one thing, unfortunate but an aspect of life over which you had no control, since you cannot control your income, but to be slack enough to put oneself outdoors or heartless enough to put one's own kin outdoors, that was criminal. Thank you. Um, uh, the Bluest Eye, Toni Morrison's first book, if you ever watch the documentary about Toni Morrison, she talks about having heard a child when she was a child say, I don't believe in God because I prayed for two years for blue eyes and he didn't give them to me. So since he didn't give me blue eyes, I don't believe in God. And Toni Morrison was about 11 years old when this friend of hers said that to her and The Bluest Eye was published when she was 30. So those of you who are ruminating on things will be looking for your novels later. <laughs> Next, we will have Dr. Lisa Brown, who is in the English and Language Arts Department and has helped so much making this event work. <laughs> Dr. Brown is reading from Beloved. He walks to the front door and opens it. It is stone quiet. In the place where once a shaft of sad red light had bathed him, locking him where he stood, is nothing. A bleak and minus nothing. More like absence, but an absence he had to get through the same, with the same determination he had when he trusted Setha and stepped through the pulsing light. He glances quickly at the lightning white stairs. The entire railing is wound with ribbons, bows, bouquets. Paul D. steps inside. The outdoor breeze he brings with him stirs the ribbons, carefully, not quite in a hurry, but losing no time, he climbs the luminous stairs. He enters Setha's room. She isn't there, and the bed looks so small he wonders how the two of them had lain there. It has no sheets. And because the roof windows do not open, the room is stifling. Bright colored clothes lay on the floor. Hanging from a wall peg is the dress Beloved wore when he first saw her. 
A pair of ice skates nestle in a basket in the corner. He turns his eyes back to the bed and keeps looking at it. It seems to him a place he is not. With an effort that makes him sweat, he forces a picture of himself lying there, and when he sees it, it lifts his spirits. He goes to the other bedroom. Denver's is as neat as the other is messy, but still no Setha. Maybe she has gone back to work, gotten better in the days since he talked to Denver. He goes back down the stairs, leaving the image of himself firmly in place on the narrow bed. At the kitchen table, he sits down. Something is missing from 124, something larger than the people who live there, something more than beloved in the red light. He can't put his finger on it, but it seems for a moment that just beyond his knowing is a glare of an outside thing that embraces while it accuses. To his right, to the right of him, where the door to the keeping room is ajar, he hears humming. Someone is humming a tune, something soft and sweet like a lullaby. Then a few words sounds like, hi Johnny, why Johnny, sweet William, bend down low. Of course, he thinks, that's where she is, and she is lying under a quilt of merry colors. Her hair, like the dark, delicate roots of good plants, spreads and curves on the pillow. Her eyes fixed on the window are so expressionless, he is not sure she will know who he is. There's too much light here in this room. Things look sold. Jack, we rise up high, she sings. Lamb's wool over my shoulder, buttercups and clover fly. She is fingering a long clump of her hair. Paul D. clears his throat to interrupt her. Setha? She turns her head. Paul D. Ah, oh, Setha. I made the ink, Paul D. He couldn't have done it if I hadn't made the ink. What ink? Who? You shaved. Yeah. Look bad? No, you're looking good. Devil's confusion. What's this I hear about you not getting out of bed? She smiles, lets it fade, and turns her eye back to the window. I need to talk to you, he tells her. She doesn't answer. I saw Denver. She tell you? She comes in the daytime, Denver. She's still with me, my Denver. You got to get up from here, girl. He's nervous. This reminds him of something. I'm tired, Paul D. So tired, I have to rest a while. Now he knows what it reminds him of, and he shouts at her, don't you die on me. This is baby Sugg's bed. Is that what you got planned? She is so, he is so angry, he could kill her. He checks himself, remembering Denver's warning, and whispers, what you planning, Setha? Oh, I don't have no plans, no plans at all. Look, he says, Denver be here in the day, I'll be here at night. I'm going to take care of you, you hear? Start now. First off, you don't smell right. Stay there, don't move. Let me heat up some water. He stops. Is that all right, Setha, if I heat up some water? And count my feet, she asks. He steps closer. Rub your feet. Setha closes her eyes and presses her lips together. She is thinking, no, this little place by the window is where I want. And rest. There's nothing to rub now and no reason to, nothing left to bathe, assuming he even knows how. Will he do it in sections, first her face, then her hands, her thighs, her feet, her back, ending with her exhausted breasts? And if he bathes her in sections, will the parts hold? She opens her eyes, knowing the danger of looking at him. She looks at him. The peach stone skin, the crease between his ready waiting eyes, and sees it the thing in him, the blessedness that was made him, the, that made him the kind of man who can walk in a house and make a woman cry. Because with him, in his presence, they could cry and tell him things they only told each other. That time didn't stay put. That she called, but Howard and Bugler walked on down the railroad track and couldn't hear her that Amy was scared to stay with her because her feet were ugly and her back looked so bad. 
that her ma'am had hurt her feelings and she couldn't find her hat anywhere. And Paul D, what baby? She left me. Oh girl, don't cry. She was my best thing. Paul D sits down in the rocking chair and examines the quilt patch with carnival colors. His hands are limp between his knees. There are too many things to feel about this woman. His head hurts. Suddenly he remembers 6-0, trying to describe what he felt about the 30-mile woman. She's a friend to my mind. She gathered me, man. The pieces I am, she gathered them and give them back to me in all the right order. It's good, you know, when you got a woman who is a friend of your mind. So one of Toni Morrison's most famous lines is, I did not find the book I wanted to read, so I wrote it. And that's what we want for all of you. Anything you want to read that you don't find, get to writing. We'll be happy to read it. This is our last session of Toni Morrison Out Loud. And we're thrilled that all of you are here. Um, we have a lovely group of students and faculty here to help us celebrate Toni Morrison's birthday, which is February 18th which is the day that Song of Solomon begins. If you read Song of Solomon, all the action starts on February 18th, 1931, which is Toni Morrison's birthday. But when you write novels, you get to put your birthday in it, you get to put your daddy in it, you get to write songs and put those songs in it. Writing novels is like a free canvas in the universe. My name is A.J. Verdell, and I'm in the English and Language Arts Department. And I hope to see all of you many times in the English and Language Arts Department before you graduate from this illustrious university. So um, we started at 12.30, and we had one session. We started at 1.30. We had another session. This is our last session for today. But I hope you will think about Toni Morrison all day long. This is an important birthday. Her first one is an ancestor because she died on August 5th, 2019. One of my students said to me yesterday, oh, she's dead? So I'm just reminding you that Toni Morrison died on August 5th, 2019, and we're celebrating her first birthday as an ancestor. You've been listening to Nina Simone, who was Toni Morrison's favorite um, musical artist. And at the end of this, when this disbands, you'll be listening to Nina Simone again. Nina Simone has been sampled in much of the music you listen to, but there's a real education for you if you decide to listen to her music on its own. So we're going to begin now. We're going to start with a choral scholar, which is one of our highfalutin groups that we have here at the university. Um, Quarrel Scholar and 2020, 2019 graduate of Morgan in the philosophy department, Shamaya Morris is reading from Song of Solomon. The North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance agent promised to fly from Mercy to the other side of Lake Superior at 3 o'clock. Two days before the event was to take place, he tacked a note on the door of his little yellow house. At 3 p.m. on Wednesday, the 18th of February, 1931, I will take off for mercy and fly away on my own wings. Please forgive me. I love you all. Signed, Robert Smith, insurance agent. Mr. Smith didn't draw as big as a crowd as Lindbergh had four years earlier. Not more than 40 or 50 people showed up because it was already 11 o'clock in the morning on the very Wednesday he had chosen for his flight before anybody read the note. At that time of day, during the middle of the week, word of mouth news just lumbered along. Children were in school, men were at work, and most of the women were fastening their corsets and getting ready to see what tales or entrails the butcher might be given away. Only the unemployed, the self-employed, and the very young were available. Deliberately available because they heard about it, or accidentally available because they happened to be walking at that exact moment in the shore end of Not Doctor Street, a name the post office did not recognize. Town maps registered the street as Mains Avenue, but the only colored doctor in the city had lived and died on that street. And when he moved there in 1896, his patients took to calling the street, which none of them lived in or near Doctor Street. 
Later, when the Negroes moved there, and when the postal service became popular means of transferring messages among them, envelopes from Louisiana, Virginia, Alabama, and Georgia began to arrive addressed to people at house numbers on Doctor Street. The post office workers returned these envelopes or passed them on to the dead letter office. Then, in 1918, when colored men were being drafted, a few gave their addresses at the recruitment office as Dr. Street. In that way, the name acquired a quasi-official status, but not for long. Some of the city legislators whose concern for appropriate names and the maintenance of the city landmarks was the principal part of their political life saw to it that Dr. Street was never used in any official capacity. And since they knew that only Southside residents kept it up, they had notices posted in stores, barbershops, and restaurants in that part of the city saying that the avenue running northerly and southerly from Shore Road, fronting to the Lake Junction of Route 6 and 2, leading to Pennsylvania, and also running parallel to and between Rutherford Avenue and Broadway had always been and would always be known as Maines Avenue and not Dr. Street. Not Dr. Street is a famous street because of Toni Morrison. And the whole idea about it is that the street was named sort of anti-black, which is something that we all recognize. So Not Dr. Street is a famous street in literature. Next, we have a young lady who's planning a big political career, so pay attention to her name. She's a political science major here at Morgan. She's reading from beloved Alicia Fraser. In this here place, we flesh. Flesh that weeps, laughs. Flesh that dances on bare feet in grass. Love it. Love it hard. Yonder, they do not love your flesh. They despise it. They don't love your eyes. They just as soon pick them out. No more do they love the skin on your back. Yonder, they fly it. And oh, my people, they do not love your hands. Those they only use, tie, bind, chop off and leave empty. Love your hands, love them. Raise them up and kiss them. Touch others with them. Pat them together, stroke them on your face, because they don't love that either. You got to love it, you. And no, they ain't in love with your mouth. Yonder, out there, they will see it broken and break it again. What you say out of it, they will not heed. What you scream from it, they will not hear. What you put into it, to nourish your body, they will snatch away and give you leave-ins instead. No, they do not love your mouth. You got to love it. This is flesh I'm talking about here. Flesh that needs to be loved. Flesh feet that need fret, feet that need to rest and to dance. Backs that need support. Shoulders that need arms. Strong arms, I'm telling you. And oh, my people. Out yonder, hear me. They do not love your neck, unnoosed and straight. So love your neck. Put a hand on it, grace it, stroke it and hold it up. And all your inside parts that they'd soon slop for hogs, you got to love them too. The dark, dark liver, love it, love it and the beat, and the beating heart. Love that too. More than eyes or feet, more than lungs that have yet to draw free air, more than life, more than your life holding womb and your life giving private parts. Hear me now, love your heart, for this is the prize. speech, Baby Sook's speech in the clearing, and it's the most famous 
seen in the novel Beloved. Next, we will have a social work major who's reading a passage from the novel Love, Brianna Bayard. The women's, the women's legs spread wide open, so I hum. What men grow irritable, but they know it's all for them. They relax, standing by, unable to do anything but watch, is a trial, but I don't say a word. My nature is a quiet one, anyway. As a child, I was cons considered respectful. As a young woman, I was called discreet. Later on, I was thought to have wisdom maturity brings. Nowadays, silence is looked on as odd, and most of my race has forgotten the beauty of me but much by saying little. Now tongues work all by themselves with no help from the mind. Still, I used to be able to have normal conversations, and when the need arose, I could make a point strong enough to stop a womb or a knife. Not anymore, because back in the 70s, when women began to straddle chairs and dance crotch out on television, when all the magazines started featuring behinds and inner thighs as though that's all there is to a woman, well, I shut up altogether. Before women agreed to spread in public, there used to be secrets, some to hold, some to tell. Now, no, bare face being the order of the day, I hum. The words dance in my head to the music in my mouth. People come in here for a plate of crawfish or to pass the time and never notice or care that they do all the talking. I'm the background, the movie music that comes along when the sweethearts see each other for the first time, or when the husband is walking the beachfront alone, wondering if anybody saw him doing the bad thing he couldn't help. My humming encourages people, frames their thoughts like when Mildred Pierce decides she has to go to jail for her daughter. I suspect, soft as it is, my music has that kind of influence too. The way mood indigo drifting across the waves can change the way you swim. It doesn't make you dive in, but it can set your stroke or trick you into believing that you are both smart and lucky. So why not swim farther or a little farther still? What's the deep to you? I think you should give that some thought. What's the D to you? I'll tell you another secret. When you see references with capital letters like Mood Indigo or Mildred Pierce, you can look those up on the Google and it'll give you very cool information. Um, next we'll have Caitlin Davis, multi-platform production major who's reading a segment from Sula. Sula began to discover what possession was. Not love, perhaps, but possession, or at least the desire for it. She was astounded by so new an alien feeling. First, there was the morning of the night, before she actually wondered if Ajax would come by that day. Then, there was an afternoon when she stood before the mirror, finger tracing the laugh lines around her mouth, and trying to decide whether she was good looking or not. She ended this day perusal by tying a green ribbon around her hair. The green silk made a ripping whisper as she slid it into her hair, a whisper that could easily have been Hannah's chuckle, a soft snow nasal hiss she used to emit when something amused her. Like women sitting for two hours under the marceling irons, only to wonder two days later how soon they would need another appointment. The ribbing tying was following, followed by another activity. And when Ajax came that evening, bringing her a reed whistle he had carved that morning, not only was the green ribbon still in her hair, but the bathroom was gleaming, the bed was made, and the table was set for two. Thank you. Um, next, we have an information systems major reading from Tony Morrison's later novel, Love, Joel Allo. He believed he was safe. He stood at the railing of HMS store Coney's Garden and sucked in a great gulps of air. 
his heart pounding in sweet expectation as he stared at the harbor. Queen of France blushed a little in the lessening light and lowered her lashes before his gaze. Seven girlish white cruisers bobbed in the harbor, but a mile or so down current was a deserted pier, carefully casual. He went below to the quarters he shared with the others who had gone on shore leave, and since he had no things to gather, no book of poacher stamps, no razor blade, or no key to any door, he merely folded more tightly. He fairly molded more tightly the blanket corners under the mattress of, mattress of his bunk. He took off his shoes and knotted the laces of each one through the belt hoop of his pants. Then, after a leisurely look around, he ducked through the passway, passageway and returned to the top of the deck. He swung one leg over the railing, hesitated and considered diving head first, but trusting what his feet could tell him more than what his hands could, changed his mind and simply stepped away from the ship. The water was so soft and warm that it was up to the armpits before he realized he was in it. Quickly, he brought his knees to his chest and shot forward. He swam well. At each fourth stroke, he turned skyward and lifted his head to make sure his course was parallel to the shore but away. Although his skin blended well with the dark waters, he was careful not to lift his arms too high above the waves. He gained on the pier and was gratified that his shoes still knocked softly against his hips. After a while, he thought it was time to head inland toward the pier. As he scissored his legs for the turn, a bracelet of water circled them and yanked him into a wide, empty tunnel. He struggled to rise out of it and was turned three times. Just before the urge to breathe, water became unmanageable. He was tossed up into the velvet air and laid smoothly down on the surface of the sea. He trolled water for several minutes while he regulated his breathing. Then he struck out once more for the pier. Again, the bracelet tightened around his ankles and the wet throat swallowed him. He went down, down, and found himself not at the bottom of the sea as he expected, but whirling in a vortex. He thought nothing except, I'm going counterclockwise. No sooner had he completed the thought than he see flat and he was riding its top. Again, he trolled water, coughed, spat, and shook his head to free his ears of water. When he'd rested, he decided to swim butterfly and protect his feet from the sucking that he approached from both times from his right side. But when he tore upon the water in front of him, he felt a gentle but firm pressure along his chest, stomach, and down his thighs. Like the hand of an assistant woman, it pushed him. He fought hard to break through, but couldn't. The hand was forcing him away from the shore. The man turned his head to see what lay behind him. All he saw was water, blood tittened by a sun sliding into like a fresh, fresh heart. Far away to his right was Thor Konigsgarten, lit fore and aft. Thank you, Joel. Next, we have a health education major reading from the bluest eye, Brian Duperval. Three quarts of milk. That's what was in the icebox yesterday. Three whole quarts. Now they ain't none. Not a drop. I don't mind folks coming in and getting what they want, but three quarts of milk? What the devil does anybody need three quarts of milk for? I don't know what I'm supposed to be running here. A charity ward? I guess it's time for me to get out the giving line and get in the gain line. I guess I ain't supposed to have none. I guess I'm, I'm supposed to end up in the poorhouse. Look like nothing I do is going to keep me out there. Folks just spend all their time trying to give me ways to get in the poorhouse. I got as much business with another mouth to feed as a cat has with side pockets. As if I don't, tr as if I don't have trouble enough trying to feed my own and keep out the poorhouse. Now I got someone else in here just going to drink me dry. Well, nah, she ain't. Not as long as I got... Not as long as I got strength in my body and a tongue in my head. There's a limit to everything. I ain't got none to just throw away. Don't know. Don't nobody need three quarts of milk. Here we four don't need three quarts of milk. That's just downright simple. I'm willing to do what I can for folks. Can't nobody say I ain't. But this has got to stop, and I'm just don't want to stop it. Bible say, watch as well as pray. Folks just dump their children off on you and go on about their business. And nobody even peeped in here to see whether that child has a loaf of bread. Look like they would just peep in here to see if I had a loaf of bread to give her. But nah, that thought don't cross their mind. That old trifling colleague been out of jail for two whole days and ain't been in here to check if his own child was alive or not. She could be dead for her, you know. Thank you, Brian. What 
or baritone you have. Um, next, we have an economics major reading a section from Beloved, Tyree Russell. Went to for a spiteful, full of a baby's venom. The women in the house knew it, and so did the children. For years, each put up with the spites in his own way, but by 1873, Setha and her daughter Denver were its only victims. The grandmother, Baby Suggs, was dead, and the sons, Howard and Bugler, had run away by the time they were 13 years old. As soon as merely looking again, the mirror shattered it. That was the signal for Bugler. As soon as two tiny handprints appeared in the cake, that was it for Howard. Now the boy waited to see more. Another kettle full of chickpeas smoking in a heat on the floor. Soda crackers crumbled and strewn in a line next to the door sill. Nor did they wait for one of the relief periods, the weeks, months even, when nothing was disturbed. No. Each one fled at once, the moment the house committed what was for him the one insult not to be borne or witnessed a second time, within two months in the dead of winter, leaving their grandmother, baby Suggs, Sepha, their mother, and their little sister, Denver, all by themselves in the gray and white house on Bluestone Road. It didn't have a number then, because Cincinnati didn't stretch that far. In fact, Ohio had been calling itself a state only 70 years, when first one brother and then the next stuffed quilt packing into his hat, snatched up his shoes, and crept away from the lively spike the house felt for them. Thank you. So you can see from that beginning of Beloved that that's the story of a house falling apart. The brothers have run away, the grandmothers died, and the house is spiteful. Next, we have an electrical engineering major, Kobana Orleans Kobe, and he's reading a section from Sula. Well, I'll be reading um, page 148 to 149 from Sula. Several times she tried to cry out, but the fatigue barely let her open, but the fatigue barely let her open her lips. Let alone take the deep breath necessary to scream. So she lay there wondering how soon she would gather enough strength to lift her arm and push the rough qu quilt away from her shin and whether she should turn her cheek to the cooler side of the pillow now or wait till her face was thoroughly soaked and the move would be more refreshing. But she was reluctant to move her face from another reason, for another reason. If she turned her head, she would not be able to see the border up window Eva jumped out of. And looking at those four wooden planks with the steel rod slanting across them was the only piece she had. The sealed window soothed her with its sturdy termination and its unassailable finality. It was, at, it was as though for the first time she was completely alone where she had always wanted to be, free from the possibility of distraction. It would be here, only here, held by this blind window high above the elm tree that she might draw her legs up to her chest, close her eyes, put her thumb into her mouth, and float over and down the tunnels, just missing the dark walls down, down until she met a rain scent and would know the, and would know the water was near. And she would curl into its heavy softness and would envelop her, carry her, and wash her tired flesh away, always. Always, who said that? She tried, she tried hard to think, who was it that had promised her a sleep of water always? The effort to recall was too great. It loosened, it loosened a knot in her chest that turned her thoughts again to the pain. Thank you. Thank you, Kobana. 
Uh, so you can read Sula and find out why her grandmother Eva jumped out of that window. Um, a PhD candidate in the Department of English and Language Arts, reading from Song of Solomon, Ms. Juanita Gillian. But Guitar spoke softly to her. You think because he doesn't love you that you are worthless? You think because he doesn't want you anymore that he's right? That his judgment and opinion of you are correct? If he throws you out, then you're garbage. You think he belongs to you because you want to belong to him? Hagar, don't. It's a bad word, belong. Especially when you put it with somebody you love. Love shouldn't be like that. Did you ever see the way the clouds love a mountain? They circle all around it. And sometimes you can't even see the mountain for the clouds. But you know what? You go up top and what do you see? His head. The clouds never cover the head. His head pokes through because the clouds let him. They don't wrap him up. They let him keep his head high, free with nothing to hide him or bind him. Hear me, Hagar. He spoke to her as he would to a very young child. You can't own a human being. And you can't lose what you don't own. Suppose you did own him. Could you really love somebody who was absolutely nobody without you? You really want somebody like that? Somebody who falls apart when you walk out the door. You don't, do you? And neither does he. You are turning over your whole life to him, your whole life, girl. And if it means so little to you that you can just give it away, hand it to him, then why should it mean any more to him? He can't value any more than you value yourself. He stopped. She did not move or give any sign that she had heard him. Pretty woman, he thought. Pretty little black-skinned woman who wanted to kill for love, die for love. The pride and the conceit of these doormat women amazed him. Yes, doormat women are also a subject of Toni Morrison's novels. Thank you for that full-throated reading, Ms. Gilliam. Next, we will have a choral scholar and English major reading from jazz, Mia Boulware. <clears throat> My footprints messed everything up. And when I looked back at where I'd walked, saw myself standing there in street shoes, no galoshes, wet to the ankles, I knew. I didn't feel the cold, though, because I was remembering it the way it was in our time, the warm October, remember? The rose of Sharon was still heavy with flowers, lilac trees, pines, that tulip tree where Indians gathered that looked like a king. The first time we met there, I got there before you. Two white men were sitting on a rock. I sat on the ground right next to them until they got disgusted and moved off. 
You had to be working or looking like you was to be anywhere near there. That's why I brought my sample case along to look like I was delivering something important. Yeah, it was forbidden, all right, but nobody loud talked us at that time. And it gave the thing an edge, being there a danger that was more than me and you being together. I scratched our initials on that rock those men moved away from, D and J. Later on, after we had a place and a routine, I brought you treats, worrying each time what to bring that would make you smile and come again the next time. How many phonograph records, how many silk stockings, the little kit to mend the runs, remember? The purple metal box with flowers on top full of Schraff's chocolates, cologne and a blue bottle that smelt like a whore. Flowers once, but you were disappointed with that treat, so I gave you a dollar to buy whatever you wanted with it. A whole day's payback home when I was young, just for you. Anything just for you to bite down hard, chew up the core, and have the taste of red apple skin to carry around for the rest of my life. In Malvone's nephew's room, with the Iceman's sign in the window, your first time, and mine in a manner of speaking, for which, and I will say it again, I would strut out the garden, strut, as long as you held on to my hand, girl. Dorcas, girl, your first time and mine, I chose you. Nobody gave you to me. Nobody said, that's the one for you. I picked you out. Wrong time, yep, and doing wrong by my wife. But the picking out, the choosing, don't ever think I fell for you or fell over you. I didn't fall in love, I rose in it. I saw you and made up my mind, my mind, and I made up my mind to follow you too. That's something I know how to do from way back. Maybe I didn't tell you that part about me. Thank you. And now we have reading from Beloved, um, a student in our fabulous new nursing program, Rabia Chaudhry. After situating herself on a huge flat-sided rock, baby Suggs bowed her head and prayed silently. The company watched her from, her from the trees. They saw she was ready when she put her stick down. Then she shouted, let the children come, and they ran from the trees toward her. Let your mothers hear you laugh, she told them, and the woods rang. The adults looked on and could not help smiling. Then let the grown men come, she shouted. They stepped out one by one from among the, ringing, among the ringing trees. Let your wives and your children see you dance, she told them, and ground life shuddered under their feet. Finally, she called the woman to her. Cry, she told them, for the living and the dead, just cry. Without covering their eyes, the women let loose. It started that way laughing children, dancing men, crying women, and then it got mixed up. Women stopped crying and danced, men sat down and cried, children danced, women laughed, children cried, until exhausted and riven, all and each lay about the clearing damp and gasping for breath. In the silence that followed, baby sucks, holy, offered up to them her great big heart. Thank you. Now we have reading from the bluest eye, uh, Ms. Kimberly Collins, who teaches in the Department of English and Language Arts. These sugar brown Mobile girls move through the streets without a stir. They are as sweet and plain as butter cake. Slim ankles, long, narrow feet, 
They wash themselves with orange-colored Life Boy soap, dust themselves with cashmere bouquet talc, clean their teeth with salt on a piece of rag, soften their skin with Jergens lotion. They smell like wood, newspapers and vanilla. They straighten their hair with Dixie peach and part it on the side. At night, they curl it in paper from brown bags, tie a print scarf around their heads, and sleep with hands folded across their stomachs. They do not drink, smoke, or swear, and they still call sex nookie. They sing second soprano in the choir, and although their voices are clear and steady, they are never picked to solo. They are in the second row, white blouses, starched, blue skirts, almost purple from ironing. They go to land-grant colleges, normal schools, and learn how to do the white man's work with refinement, home economics to prepare the, his food, teacher education to instruct black children in obedience music to soothe the weary master and entertain his blunted soul. Here they learn the rest of the lesson, begun in those soft houses with porch swings and pots of bleeding heart. How to behave, the careful development of thrift, patience, high morals, and good manners. In short, how to get rid of the funkiness the dreadful funkiness of passion, the funkiness of nature, the funkiness of the wide range of human emotions. Wherever it erupts this funk, they wipe it away. Where it crusts, they dissolve it. Wherever it drips, flowers, or clings, they find it and fight it until it dies. They fight the battle all the way to the grave. The laugh that is a little too loud, the enunciation a little too round, the gesture a little too generous. They hold their behind in for fear of a sway too free. When they wear lipstick, they never cover their entire mouth for fear of lips too thick. And they worry, worry, worry about the edges of their hair. So I mentioned to you before about race-based language, which means that sometimes when people say things to you like color, you think they're talking about your race. So Morrison did a lot of work in her novels to change color to actually mean color, like tea brown hair or periwinkle sky. So I'm gonna read you one little paragraph from Beloved, and the lady is on her deathbed, and she's thinking about color, it doesn't have anything to do with race. Baby Suggs didn't even raise her head. From her sick bed, she heard them go, but that was not the reason she lay still. It was a wonder to her that her grandsons had taken so long to realize that every house wasn't like the one on Bluestone Road. Suspended between the nastiness of life and the meanness of the dead, she couldn't get interested in leaving life or in living it, let alone the fright of two creeping off grandsons. Her past had been like her present, intolerable. And since she knew death was anything but forgetfulness, she used what little energy she had left to ponder color. So this is a big day. Another writer, Audre Lorde, who was a poet, black woman, shared Toni Morrison's birthday. So for the rest of February 18th, think of Toni Morrison, Audre Lorde, thank you for celebrating with us. <laughs>